If you have your Bible, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews 10. We're coming to a very important passage in the book of Hebrews. In fact, it's a very important passage for our lives. Last week, we began by looking at the first 18 verses of Hebrews, and um, today we pick up in verse 19, and we're going to go from 19 through 25. And I want to encourage you, if you have your Bibles, open up um, uh, open up the Bibles on the app. There is the notes there as well. The verses are listed there as well. But read with me from verses 19 down to verse 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as in the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. The first word there in verse 19 is the word therefore. And anytime you see that, you want to look back to see what the author was saying before that, and you want to see forward to see what the author is saying for us. And so let's look back at the first 18 verses and see what the author was saying. Last week we looked at this. We know that the Old Testament law, the sacrifices, the priest, all of that was a shadow of something better to come. The sacrifices that the priests would make was a shadow it was only a shadow because these sacrifices and these offerings that the priests would make, we could never remedy the problem of sin in our lives. It could deal with the outside issues that we've committed sin, but it never dealt with our heart. It never dealt with the fact that our hearts were screwed up, that our hearts were a mess. And so this Old Testament system of sacrifices, offerings, the priesthood, all of that stuff served as a shadow of something better. The shadow was Jesus who comes and when he makes the sacrifice, his once and for all sacrifice, when he is our high priest offering himself on the cross for our sins, no more offerings need to be made. No more sacrifices need to be done. No more confessions need to happen. We are forgiven once and for all because of Jesus. And in light of our forgiveness, our text this morning the author gives us three things that we have to do in light of our forgiveness. Because we have been forgiven, because we've been washed and made into the family of God, the author says there's three things that need to happen in your life. Command number one, let us draw near. Verse 22, let us draw near. We're to draw near to God. What does that really look like? What does it mean to draw near to God? Based on what we've seen so far in our text, based on what we've learned in Hebrew so far, you can say that drawing near to God means that doing everything that you do in life on the basis of your forgiveness. Everything that you do every single day, you do because you have been forgiven by God. It motivates how you live your life. And when you do that, you're drawing near to God. When you do that, you're worshiping Him. See, when Jesus did in coming and offering himself. He said, I no longer want you to remember your sins. I want you to remember your forgiveness. I want you to forget the sins that you've done. And I want you to remember that I have forgiven you so that if you will do everything in life on the basis of the fact that you have been forgiven, you're drawing near to me. That when what motivates you in life, what motivates you is that, God, you have transformed me. And I want to live my life in light of the fact that you have changed me. You are drawing near to God. You are worshiping him. You are being pulled into him. So when you come in the morning or whenever you do your devotionals and you open up your Bible and you begin to read, you're reading it because you understand that God has spoken to us through his servants. That God's revelation to sinners is effective because Jesus died for our sins. That we can read the Bible and know that it will change our lives because Jesus paid the price so that it could change our lives. And on the basis of forgiveness, I come to the book, to the Bible, expecting God 
to change me, expecting God to speak to me. When I get on my knees and pray to him, not because I think that if I pray loud enough or long enough or if I say the right formula that God will pay attention to me. No, I get on my knees and pray because Jesus died for my sins and because Jesus died, I can now go to God and talk to him anytime I want about anything I want. There's freedom there to be able to pray. When I go to work tomorrow morning, I go to do my work with excellence. Not because I have to get the accolades or the acceptance or praise of my employer, but because I've been forgiven. No sin has been held against me, and I am free to live out what God has called me and gifted me and enabled me to do because I am forgiven. So I'm going to do my work on the basis of my forgiveness. When I talk with you this morning, After service, when we have fellowship lunch and I'm building relationships with you and we're building relationships with one another, I don't do it to earn your acceptance or your approval or make you like me. I do it on the basis of the fact that I have been forgiven. I'm going to interact with you because Jesus has forgiven all of my sins. Everything I do in life is on the basis that God has accepted me because of Jesus. That transforms how you live your life. That transforms what you do with other people. That transforms your relationships. This is drawing near to God. This is what it means to worship, that your life is completely transformed by Jesus. And the passage encourages us by telling us why we should draw near. And there's several reasons listed here. Verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. There's some language here from the Old Testament shadow from the sacrifices. There's the idea of entering the holy place. The holy place, we talked about this before, was the sacred place where only the priest could enter. It was the place where the presence of God was. No one could enter there. The priest could go in, but only one time a year. And if he went with sin in his life, he would die instantly. This was a place absolutely separated from the people. There was a curtain that separated the holy place from where the people stood. No one could enter there. The only way you can get direct access was to go through that curtain. But no one had permission except the priest. But now, Jesus appears. The shadow is no more. He becomes the veil through which we enter the presence of God. So that if you place your faith in Jesus, if he is your life, if he has transformed you, you have the ability to freely walk into his presence anytime, any place. You have been forgiven. The word there, confidence, is probably not the best word because confidence in our day and age makes it sound like you can walk in and say, God, I'm here Do what I tell you to do. But that's not the idea the word is conveying. It's the idea, maybe the better word is freely or freedom. It's the idea that you have the ability to walk into the very presence of God, speak to God as if you have the same relationship with God that Jesus has with God. That you have the same opportunity to talk to God the way the Son talks to God. That's what it means to say that you have been forgiven. You can go in, talk to God the Father, just like God the Son can talk. There's another reason. Verse 22, 21, we also have a high priest over the house of God. Jesus is not just any other priest. He is the high priest who is now the mediator between a perfect God and us, imperfect, sinful people. He's establishing opportunity for us to have relationship with God. What's amazing is that Jesus is mediating this relationship for us, and he is relating to us with complete understanding of our weakness. The Bible says that he was tempted and tried and suffered in every way, just like we are, but without sin. So he knows our struggles. He knows our pains. He knows our difficulties. He knows the things that we go through in life. And he was able to live our lives without sin. And he can stand mediating between us and God, who is holy and perfect. And he brings two unlikely characters, a holy God and sinful people, and brings them to the table and say, you can have a relationship. That's what happens because of Jesus 
shouldn't move this thing around too much. He can bring two of us together. And the reason you draw near to God is because Jesus is your mediator. But there's a third reason. And that is because our hearts have been sprinkled clean with an evil conscience and our bodies have been washed with water. Again, this is language from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, when the priests would go into the tabernacle, they would have to sprinkle blood on everything to symbolize that it had been purified for worship. They would have to wash everything to symbolize that it was ready to be able to be used for worship. So the language is now being attributed to what Jesus has done. And he's saying that because of the sacrifice of Jesus, by the shedding of his blood, he has washed your heart clean of an evil conscience. Do you know what that means? We talked about this last week. But the scars of the sins that you have done in your life, the guilt, the shame of the things that you have done, they're no longer there because Jesus has washed them clean. Not only has he washed them clean, he gives you a new heart, a heart where he writes his law onto your heart, and he is with you, and he resides in you. He's given you a brand new heart. But Jesus doesn't just stop at your heart. He takes our bodies that have been defiled by the sins that we've done, and he washes our bodies with his offering so that now our hearts and our bodies are clean. So nothing, no sin that we've ever done creates a barrier between me and my relationship with God. I draw near to God because there is no hindrance or barrier between me and God anymore ever again. The passage also tells us how we're to draw near. We're to draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance. That means that you and I are to draw near to God simply by acknowledging and accepting that we are completely and totally forgiven of our sins because of Jesus. There's not a thing that we do that makes us acceptable to God. We are accepted because of what Jesus did. No amount of work we do will say, okay, God, God says, okay, you've done enough. That's not how it works. You're accepted by the fact that Jesus paid it all. See, I recognize this is a challenge to say that we are forgiven on the basis of what someone else did, not on what we've done. That's a challenge for us. But listen, there is no sin that you have ever committed that is more powerful than the offering of Jesus. Nothing. It doesn't matter what you're sitting here with this morning. It doesn't matter what you've done. There is no sin you've committed that is more powerful than the offering of Jesus. If you want to draw near to God, it always begins by accepting that you are forgiven. Draw near to God. That's the first command. The second command is this. You hold fast to the confession of your faith without wavering. Hold fast. The confession is simply Jesus Christ. That's our confession. Everything that the he writer of Hebrews has been telling us, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came in the flesh, that he is greater than Moses and greater than Abraham, that he became our high priest, that he was the ultimate sacrifice, that he came and gave his life so that we can be forgiven. That's the confession. We hold fast to the confession that our forgiveness is guaranteed in Christ. Nothing else, just Jesus. That's our confession. And we hold fast to that confession without wavering. We're not going to be moved from that reality no matter how deep our failure, no matter how we might not feel forgiven in the moment, no matter how our emotions may move us from that confession, we hold fast to it. It is our only hope. We have no other hope other than in Jesus. There is no other hope. There is no other way. And the reason we hold fast to that confession is because Jesus, who made the promise, who made the promise of forgiveness, who made the promise of eternal life, who made the promise of redemption and hope and peace and joy and love and rescue out of this broken world and redemption of everything that is broken and making right of things that are wrong, that Jesus who made that promise is always faithful to keep his promise. 
He never goes back on his word. He is faithful to what he said. So the reason why we can hold fast to the confession is because God doesn't lie. He's true day in and day out. And if he has promised your forgiveness, you can bank on this fact that you are forgiven because of Jesus. You may be living your life this moment and you may feel like, I have no idea how God can forgive me of my sins. You might not want to hold fast to the confession of your faith, but the reason you hold fast is because God has promised to forgive you. And if Jesus promised to forgive you, you can bank on it. You can count on it. And there is nothing that you do that is more powerful than a promise that God makes. Absolutely nothing. And he has promised to forgive. Hold fast to the confession of the faith of the one, because the one who promised is faithful. Confession number three, or command number three. Let us consider each other. Most of your translations will say consider. And that's probably, again, not the best word there that's could use because when we think of consider, we're just kind of thinking casually pay attention to one another or just notice the people around us. But the word here that use, is used to, word, to communicate the word consider actually means it's not casual at all. It's not, oh, just pay attention to who's around you. But it means to pay careful attention. Make sure you know what's going on in people's lives, to study one another, to really pay attention to what each person is going through in the body of Christ. Let me be honest. If we really did that, if we really began to pay attention to one another, if we really begin, if you're part of this church and you come here and you're part of what's happening here and you get involved in paying attention to one another, do you know what happens? We've all been here at one point or another. We pay attention, and by paying attention, we actually get offended by what people are doing. Somebody's personality will irritate me. The way someone talks can be annoying. Somebody does something that bothers me and I don't like it. Somebody says something and I disagree with it. And all of a sudden, my paying attention to other people intentionally results in me being upset, frustrated, angry, ticked off at somebody in our group. That's what happens. Have you been there? You've been there. I've been there. That's what happens when we pay attention to each other at an increasing level. We begin to see the faults in one another, and we are provoked not to love and good deeds, but we're provoked to gossip and slander and backbiting and frustration and anger and bitterness and hatred toward people. That's what happens when we begin to pay attention to one another without first drawing near to God. But if we begin to draw near to God first, we begin to remember that the only reason I'm able to even come to God is because of his grace and his mercy. It's because he found, he gave me forgiveness even despite of my sins. And Jesus paid for the forgiveness of my sins so that I can draw near to him. And nobody else's faults around me are so significant that it can keep me away from God. My sin is what kept me away from him, and God forgave me. And if God could forgive me from what kept me from him, then I can pay attention to people and all they do and all they do wrong, even their faults, and find within me understanding and compassion and grace and concern and love and mercy to provoke them to love and good works. It only happens if you first draw near to God. If I'm not drawing near to God first, I'm going to see someone else's fault, and I'm going to conclude that I'm sure glad I'm not like them. Or they're just so much worse than I am. Or I'm glad God didn't make me like that. Or somebody needs to tell them that this sermon was for them. Um, we're going to look at other people in a negative light. That's what we'll do. We'll begin to think about other people's faults instead of our own. We'll see their faults, and we're going to be provoked to bad stuff. But if we will first draw near to God, if we will recognize that it is His grace, His mercy that saved me, then we'll be able to love and encourage one another. 
let's say I'm drawing near to God and I don't want to point a Benzi, but let's point a Benzi. That bozo right there, um, this week he slandered me. He's here worshiping Jesus and he's downloaded the Loft app and he's taking notes and everything. And, but I found out that he offended me or slandered me this week. But he's worshiping Jesus. If I'm not drawing near to God, my response would be, God, will you strike him down? Right? I mean, he needs a little beating, right? Um, what, what do you do when someone is doing that? When there's people in your own community that's attacking you or hurting you or offending you, what do you do? Think about it. If you're drawing near to God, if you're in love with Jesus, and you see the blood of Jesus has forgiven your sins and covering your sins, you're going to respond to that person in kindness. Why? Because it was the kindness of God that drew you in. It wasn't God's wrath that drew you to him. It was his kindness. It was his mercy that brought you to him. And when you have experienced the kindness of God, even though you hated God, when someone attacks you or offends you, you can offer that same kindness back to them, even though they might not deserve it, because that's what God gave you, even though you didn't deserve it. It is God's kindness that drew us in. We're supposed to make sure that we're paying attention to one another. But that only works if you are drawing near to God yourself and you are holding fast to the confession of your faith. The passage tells us how we're to draw near to God, how we're supposed to consider one another. I'm sorry. It says we're supposed to consider one another by gathering together. We're not supposed to abandon the idea of getting together as some are in the habit of doing. You know what that verse means? It means that the natural progression for us is not to spend time with one another. The natural progression is not to create opportunities to be provoked to love and kindness. That's not the normal progression for things. What is the habit or the normal progression of things for most of us is to avoid situations that create the most opportunity for people to see how we really are. We want people to see how good we are, so we avoid people. That's not natural for us to be around people and for them to see our weaknesses and our challenges. But we're challenged in this passage here to make sure we're gathering together. Let me encourage you, if you're here this morning and you, this is your church and you're not inconsistent on coming, be here. Come faithfully. Come weekly, because this is where we encourage one another. I want to encourage you to be consistent in your gatherings so that you can actually engage in provoking others to love and good deeds. Do you recognize that this command is given because God designed the journey of faith not to be a lone ranger type of thing? We're not supposed to do this alone. You can't survive alone. To be honest, there's people that have come to me in the years and said they don't feel connected here or they just feel lost in the crowd. And I mean, what crowd? I mean, it's, um, they're, they don't feel like they're connecting with other people. And I can say that 90% of the time, I can look back of their track record of coming to church and the reason they're not connected is because they're not here. How are you going to get connected if you're not here around other people? And what happens is they leave they go to another church, and they're there for three to four months, and then they disappear from there. And they go to another church, and they disappear from there. And they hop from one church to the next church to the next church. And they'll never connect with anyone. You can never get connected unless you're committed to the local body. You need to be committed. Let me say this also. There's some incredible churches in this city. Churches that are doing incredible work for the kingdom of God. They're growing like crazy. But sadly, there's a lot of people in these churches that will come because it's a safe place to hide. They never get involved in community groups. They never get involved in missional groups. They can go to church when they want to go. They can leave when they want to leave. And if they're missing one Sunday, no one will ever know. 
because they're afraid to get connected for people to help them, for people to see who they really are. And can I be honest? That can happen here as well. There's some of you that will come in here, you'll sit, you'll leave right away, and no one knows who you are. You can't grow without one another. We need one another. The text there, it wasn't talking about be committed to one another because of what the church can do for you. The idea is be connected because of what you offered the church. Because when you are here, you are encouraging other people to kindness and good deeds and love. You need to be here so that we can do this together. We need to be in this together. See, I recognize that's uncomfortable for a lot of you guys, but there are a lot of commands that Jesus gives that are uncomfortable. And he didn't want us to be comfortable. He gave us these commands for our good and for life because he wants to change us. We can't do this by ourselves. It doesn't work in the journey of faith. We all need one another. And the passage tells us that we're to do this because the day of the Lord is approaching. We need to encourage one another even more. You know, in Scripture, the number one indicator that the day of the Lord approaching is suffering. It's going through hardships. It's going through difficulties. When things get difficult in your life, you need more encouragement. And we're called to gather together, pay attention to one another, where we can really be there for one another when we need it. But do you know what we do? Do you know how we live? Do you know how we respond? When things get difficult, or things are not going well in our lives spiritually, or on a personal level, or relationally, in our marriage, or in our family, or in our work, or we're stressed, or circumstances are not good because of sin, my sin, or your sin, or um, the brokenness of this world, or the limitations of our physical body, whatever it is, when things are going rough, instead of running to one another and saying, pray for me, what we do is we retreat and we hide and we don't tell anybody till it's too late. I can't tell you how many times I've counseled people who've come to me and said, my life is a mess. I've destroyed my mess. I destroyed my life. And I ask them, how long has this been going on? They tell me a long, long time. And I say, why didn't you come earlier? Wouldn't it have been so much easier when when you were beginning in this struggle that there were people around you that could have loved you and encouraged you and supported you and pushed you and made sure you didn't fall. But now here you are. Your life is a mess. And now you're looking for help. But your life is a disaster. We need one another. There's some of you here this morning that you know you're struggling. You're deeply struggling, and nobody around here knows it. You're preventing the rest of us from obeying God to provoke you to love and good deeds. And I'm not trying to make you feel guilty by saying that. I want you to hear my love and my concern. There are things that have happened in my life growing up that I needed help with. And if I didn't get the help I got, I would have destroyed my life. My tendency wasn't to tell anyone. I didn't want anyone to know. I wanted to look good in front of other people. I wanted people to approve of me based on how I behaved. And so I kept my sins hidden. And if I didn't confess it, it would have destroyed me. It would have messed me up completely. We're supposed to be there for one another, to encourage one another. We aren't meant to do this alone. Back in 2003, 10 years ago, I had just finished graduating seminary. Um, And I was in a span of a couple weeks where I had a million things going on in my life. I was graduating seminary, unofficially getting engaged. You Indians will know what that means. Um, uh, Finishing up a youth pastor internship, finishing up a hospital chaplaincy job, and moving from Oklahoma to Philadelphia all within a span of like two weeks. And so it was an incredible stressful period of time Um, and my brother came up the last week, um, and we packed all of our stuff, stuck it in the back of my SUV. We're getting ready to go back to Philadelphia. My friends, seminary friends, said, let's just do one more thing, get together and hang out before we leave. And so that Saturday morning, we all went canoeing in Lake Tahlequah in Oklahoma. And we were um, enjoying getting there and enjoying just being in the canoes and um, having a good time with another. There were eight of us that went. Me and my brother were in the same boat. We started, things were going really, really well. The trip was amazing. The scenery was amazing. And I found myself getting drawn in to my surroundings. Listen, when you begin your life journey with Jesus, it always begins with recognizing that God loved you enough to forgive all of your sins. 
when you see God's love for you like that, you can't help but be drawn in to his grace. You can't help but be overwhelmed by his love. You just draw near. You draw near because of what Jesus has done for you. So things were going really, really well in our 12-mile journey. It was like a six-hour trip that we were canoeing. And I was in the front of my boat, and my brother was in the back, and we were rowing. And after a while, this is a six-mile or 12-mile trip, and we were getting tired. We were exhausted. So the only way we kept going was that we were encouraging one another. I would, I would yell and to, back to him to say, keep rowing, and he would yell back to me to keep rowing, and we were just constantly encouraging one another. Listen, in the journey of faith, there are going to be days when you wake up and the soreness of trying to live for Jesus is going to make you feel like you can't draw near to God. That's where you need other people to come into your life and say, keep going, keep pushing, keep striving, keep moving, don't quit. Don't give up. God hasn't given up on you. We haven't given up on you. You need people around you that will motivate you to not stop halfway in between, but to reach your destination. You can't stop halfway. There'll be days when you don't feel like going to church. There'll be days when you don't feel like opening your Bible. There'll be days when you don't feel like praying. You wake up and you don't feel like drawing near to God, but you make a decision to trust in Jesus who has promised to be faithful to you even when you are unfaithful. You make a promise. You, you make a decision that, God, I'm going to keep holding on. I'm going to keep striving. I'm going to keep pushing because you have been faithful and your promises are good. And on our trip, we stopped halfway for lunch and we ate for a little bit, and then we got back on the boat, and we were rowing and canoeing and going straight. After a while, I noticed that my boat, instead of going straight, was going sideways, and I had no idea what was going on. I turned around, and I realized that my brother is not rowing anymore. He's eating food in the back of the canoe, so I'm trying to do this by myself. And so by the time I yell at him to start rowing again, it was too late. Our canoe hit the bank. We went straight up. I have no idea what happened, but the next thing I know, I was in the water. I couldn't find my brother anywhere. After a while, I realized where he was. His life jacket got caught in some twigs or branches or something, and he was holding on. He couldn't free himself, panicking, freaking out. I was floating away. Our canoe was gone. Our boat was gone. One of the guys on our trip was a former Army guy who was experienced at rescuing people for some reason, but he didn't panic. He just jumped out of his canoe, got, cut, took a knife out, cut the branches, rescued my brother, rescued me, ran and got the canoe back, and brought us back to safety. Listen, the beginning half of the trip, we wouldn't have made it if my brother wasn't encouraging me. We, I wouldn't be standing here if that other person wasn't there for me. That when I was in a hardship where I was about to lose my life, there was someone there that came and rescued me out of that water. We're not meant to do this alone. All of us have difficulties and hardships in our lives. If you try to do it alone, you'll destroy your life. I want to challenge you. If you feel like you can just show up and leave, you're not following the commands of Scripture. If you feel like you can just pick and choose when you want to show up, it hurts you, but it hurts the church. We need one another. Some of you are at the beginning of this journey of stage one, and you're overwhelmed by the love of God. You've experienced his grace and his mercy, and it's transformed you, and it's overwhelming, overwhelming to you. Can I encourage you? Tell someone here. Because there's some of us that are beat up and tired. We need to be reminded of what you're experiencing right now. We need to be reminded that God is good, that God is faithful, that God is kind. There are others of you who are at stage two. You don't feel like doing this tomorrow. You need to come along someone and say, I need to hold fast to the confession of my faith. Will you hold fast with me? I don't want to give up because Jesus promises to never give up on me. Listen, we got to do this together. Together we can draw near. Together we can hold fast. And together we can provoke each other to love and good deeds. And lives will be changed 
for the glory of Christ. Look around this room. There's people from every nation, not every nation, but different nations, different backgrounds. What unites us here is not our ethnicity. What unites us here is not our backgrounds. What unites us here is not what jobs we have. What unites us here is that we have all been forgiven by Jesus. That I can look at Julia and say she's my sister because of Jesus. And I can look, you can look at me and say, he doesn't look like me, but he's my brother because of Jesus. This is what the body of Christ is supposed to be. We're brothers, we're sisters. We take care of one another. And we do that because of Jesus. That's the only reason we do it. In a moment, we're coming up to the communion table. And we recognize that as we come to the table, it is the blood of Jesus that has washed us of our sins. It is the blood of Jesus that makes us a part of the family of God. It is the blood of Jesus that makes me and you brothers and sisters. It is his work. And so we live our lives drawing near to God day in and day out, holding fast to the confession that God is faithful to keep his promises and taking care of one another because we need one another. So I'm going to ask you to examine your heart, examine your attitudes, examine your affections. See if there's anything in your life that's not from Jesus. And if there is, would you confess? Would you repent? And I'm going to invite you to come to the table, grab the elements. In a few moments, we will take the bread and the juice together. But would you examine your life and see, God, I'm not drawing near to you. I need to. I'm not holding fast to the confession of my faith. I'm trying to earn this on my own. I need to trust you. God, I'm not caring for one another. I need to really be part of the body of Christ. I need to do that. If God is convicting you this morning, would you let the Holy Spirit work in your life? And would you come to the table, the ultimate sign of God's grace and redemption in our lives? Partake of the table and remind yourself that he is faithful. He is always faithful, even when we are unfaithful. Father, this morning, as we come, we confess that it's so much easier for us to try to do this on our own. It's so much easier for us to think that it's just me and you, God, and no one else. But we need one another. I need my brothers, and I need my sisters, and they need me. So forgive us of not being open. Forgive us of not being transparent because it is you that called us to be part of one family. Help us to be obedient to you. This morning as we come to the table, we come humbly knowing that you have saved us. You have redeemed us. And we thank you for it. We love you.